Hello and welcome to Daily Prayer today for June 2nd, 2021. Glad that you are with me. I'm Reverend Ochart. Let's go ahead and get started. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. The Lord's unfailing love and mercy never cease, fresh as the morning and sure as the sunrise. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of all glory, we give you thanks that through the gift of baptism we have been crucified with Christ and united with him in resurrection. By the power of your Holy Spirit, let our lives proclaim the good news that we are dead to sin and alive to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our readings for today are Psalm 65 and 147, verses 1 through 11, Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 11, 2 Corinthians 7, 2 through 16, and Luke 17 through 20, verse 20 through 37. Listen for God's word to speak to you. Psalm 65. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion. And to you shall vows be performed. O you who answer prayer, to you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation. You are the hope of all the end of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength you establish the mountains. You are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. Those who live at earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. Your water is its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks, the valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord! How good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcast of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure is in the speed of a runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Reading uh, Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 11. If prophets or those who divine by dreams appear among you and promise you omens or portents, And the omens or the portents declared by them take place, and they say, Let us follow other gods whom you have not known, and let us serve them. You must not heed the words of those prophets or those who divine by dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you indeed love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. The Lord your God you shall follow, God alone you shall fear. God's commandments you shall keep, God's voice you shall obey. God you shall serve, and to God you shall hold fast. But those prophets, or those who divine by dreams, shall be put to death for having spoken treason against the Lord your God. 
who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, to turn you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk, so you shall purge the evil from your midst. If anyone secretly entices you, even if it is your brother, your father's son, or your mother's son, or your own son or daughter, or the wife you embrace, or your most intimate friend, saying, Let us go worship other gods whom neither you nor your ancestors have known, any of the gods of the people that are around you, whether near you or far away from you, from one end of the earth to the other, you must not yield to or heed any such persons. Show them no pity or compassion, and do not shield them. But you shall surely kill them. Your own hand shall be first against them to execute them, and afterwards the hand of all the people. Stone them to death for trying to turn you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Then all Israel shall hear and be afraid and never again do any such wickedness. 2 Corinthians 7, 2, 1 through 16. That's not even close. Chapter 7, verse 2 through 16. Make room in your hearts for us. And we we have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. I often boast about you. I have great pride in you. I am filled with consolation. I am overjoyed in all our affliction. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted in every way. Disputes without a fear without and fears within, but God who consoles the downcast consoled us by the arrival of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was consoled about you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice still more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that I grieved you with that letter, though only briefly. Now I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance, for you felt a godly grief, so that you were not harmed in any way by us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret, but worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves guiltless in the, ma- in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the one who was wrong, but in order that your zeal for us might be made known to you before God, in this we find comfort. In addition to our own consolation, we rejoice still more in the joy of Titus, because his mind has been set at rest by all of you. For if I have been somewhat boastful about you to him, I was not disgraced. But just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting to Titus has proved true as well, and his heart goes out all the more to you, as he remembers the obedience of all of you, and how you welcomed him with fear and trembling. I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. And our gospel reading for Luke 17, verses 20 through 37. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisee when the kingdom of God, Pharisees, excuse me, when the kingdom of God was coming, and he answered, The kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for in fact, the kingdom of God is among you. Then he said to his disciples, the days are coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. They will say to you, look there and look here. Do not go, do not set off in pursuit, for as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky, From one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. But first, he must endure much suffering and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so too it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. 
And the flood came and destroyed all of them. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day that Lot left Sodom, it rained fire and sulfur from heaven and destroyed all of them. It will be like that on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, anyone on the housetop who has belongings in the house must not come down to take them away, and likewise anyone in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Those who try to make their life secure will lose it, but those who lose their life will keep it. I tell you, on that night there will be be two in one bed, one will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding meal together. One will be taken and the other left. Then they asked him, Where, Lord? He said to them, Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So our readings for today, we have um, from uh, Deuteronomy Moses has some very strong words for the people about not worshiping other idols. Again, um, this is uh, sort of right in line with continuing on this idea that, that the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall worship the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. You shall worship the Lord alone, right? So there are a bunch of idols in this land that we are going to, that you are going to, because. Moses is not going to this land. When you go into this land, you're going to be tempted to serve all of these other gods that you can see, these gods of wood and stone. If someone comes to you and they have all sorts of amazing prophetic powers, right? And they say such and such is going to happen, and then it does happen. And they say, okay, now let's go worship other gods. Don't believe them. Don't worship other gods just because they had one or two things right. If anyone tells you to worship another god, don't do it, right? I don't care if it's your brother. I don't care if it's your child. I don't know. I don't care if it's your wife or your husband. Whoever it is, don't go worship other gods, right? Don't be led astray from the worship of the one true God. Again, as we consider the sort of the analog for today of idolatry, um, There are all sorts of idols. There are all sorts of things that we place in the place that only God should be. Those things are ourselves. They are, you know, institutions. They are um, ideals. They are money. They are power. They are whatever it is, right? We put all of these things in, in, in that place that only God should have. And we try to serve these things, try to get more money, try to get you know, whatever it is. Um, All of these things can take that place. And so if anyone calls us away from the worship of the living God to these other ideologies and idolatries, to say no, right? Get back on track. Um, A constant reminder and call. Sometimes those calls are challenging. And, And so we hear from Paul a little bit of this not remorse, right? Um, He is happy that even though his first letter was striking to them, even though it kind of caused them this, this, um, this godly grief, that because of it, they were able to repent. Because he was able to say these stronger words, they were able to sort of change their ways, change their facing. Um, decide to turn towards God rather than this these other things that they were turning to. And so he says that's good, right? That's a good thing. There's a difference between grief and just causing people harm and and pain and godly grief, grief that produces um this this longing and this zeal for for the things of God. And so he says it's a, it's a good thing that you had this grief because it brought you to this repentance. Um Grief by itself is not a good thing, right? Um, uh, just causing someone pain uh, for no reason, that's not a good thing. But um, there's that sort of like healing pain. So um, think of uh, when you get a cut and you put some alcohol on it, right? It cleanses it, but it hurts a lot. Um, it is very painful. It's part of that process in order to 
to heal and to grow. Sometimes there are things that we that we put on, you know, on the the tender parts of our hearts that are stinging and they hurt. And we don't want those toes to get stepped on. And yet it calls us to this godly grief um, and calls us to repentance. Other times we can be causing grief and just be causing grief. Um, and it's hard to discern the difference between the two. But our call is to be those who call other to repentance and sometimes use those harsh words um, rather than maybe those who use harsh words and sometimes call to repentance, right? You know, maybe that's the, the distinction. Then we have from Luke, um, a Pharisee asked Jesus about the coming of the kingdom of God, right? Uh, they're asking about a literal kingdom. When is the literal kingdom of God going to come? Again, this Pharisee, all of the people around in the first century are waiting for, you know, the coming of Israel, the, the restoring of Israel, um, the, the defeat of Rome as oppressors over them. And Jesus says, no, it's, this kingdom doesn't come like anything like you're talking about. There's not a place where you can say, oh, here it is, right? Oh, here is, you know, here's July 4th, the, the Independence Day for the kingdom of God, right? There's, that's not the kind of kingdom it is. He says, it's here among you. And then he goes in and talks to his disciples and talks about what does that kingdom look like? What does the return of Christ look like? Don't be looking for the return of Christ. It's, it's, when it comes, it's gonna, you're going to know it. It's not going to be a surprise, right? That's kind of the idea. But keep looking for the coming of the kingdom of God. Keep looking for that, that um, coming of, of Jerusalem coming down. And then um, some images of what does that look like? The image of, of Noah and of Lot. Um, this is one of those places that people kind of turn to, this idea, especially of in that day, there'll be two in a bed and one will be taken and one will stay. And that's sort of connected to this idea of a, um, of a rapture where God brings all God's people up. Um, I'll just point out that in the, in the story of Noah, in the story of Lot, the people who are taken are the people who die. <laughs> They're the people who are being punished. Um, so, yeah, that's maybe not an assumption that we can make. But that there will be this time where there's sort of destruction that we kind of read about in Revelation. How does that all work? I don't know. I really don't know. And we're going to just have to see what that looks like if we get to if we see it in person or if we don't. Right. Either way, um, we live a life where any of our lives could be cut short at any time. Um, we could die any moment. Um, so how do we use the time that is given to us? Why don't we go ahead and use our time to gather together in our devotion for today, which is, what is in a name? A lot. Names reveal who we are. Hungering for justice, they also reveal unspoken prejudices. In the late 80s, my spouse Loida and I, originally from Cuba, moved to Louisville with our small children and attend seminary. To attend seminary, a fellow white Anglo student tried to say Loida's name, but kept mispronouncing it. He finally asked, why don't you change your name? My wife replied, if I have to learn how to pronounce yours, you better learn how to pronounce mine. It's the time of year when we hear once again from the prophet of Advent, Isaiah, who shares with us the many names of the promised Messiah. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Our names are important. Names can tie us to our ethnic origins and cultural traditions. Names can also reflect something that mattered to our parents in choosing what others would call us. For migrants who leave everything behind, such as family heirlooms and even an ancestral home, their names might be the only thing that ties them to their native lands. In the Bible, especially in the Hebrew scriptures, names are descriptive and rich in symbolism. Some names signify origin. Other names denote purpose or depict a person's traits, environment, identity, and personality. 
In his book, Let Justice Roll Down, Bruce C. Birch ter- tells us that names for the divine in the Hebrew scriptures describe God's salvific actions to restore wholeness to in concrete, physical, sociopolitical terms, as well as God's concern for wholeness in relationship and spirit. Examples of this include El Shaddai, meaning my Redeemer lives, Yahweh Yara, the Lord will provide, and Yovo Rapha, the Lord who heals. Names say a lot. They also can reveal prejudices we might not even know we have. For years, immigrants of every persuasion and origin had to conform to the patterns of the English-speaking, white Eurocentric society that originally colonized most of North America. Many immigrants from non-English-speaking European countries had their names changed by school teachers or clerks who could not spell or pronounce the original name. Still others voluntarily changed their names after confronting xenophobia and racism. Some would change their names, attempting to fit better into the American culture to obtain a better job. In the entertainment industry, actors' birth names were changed at the suggestion of studio executives who wanted names that were more acceptable to the public ear. Richard Valenzuela became Richie Valens, Ricky Valens. Uh, Ramon Estevez became Martin Sheen. And Margarita Carmen Cancino became Rita Hayworth. This type of discrimination is what I call forced assimilation, which gave origin to the melting pot in the United States, where all citizens would have to literally melt into one hom- homogeneous culture with English as its language and Western worldviews or face ostracism and discrimination. The implied or unconscious bias that lurks in our names is unfortunately still part of our ethos. Statistics show that applicants of color with non-English names have to send about 60% more job applications to get a positive response from employers than their white counterparts of European descent. This bias is even in the church. As a pastor nominating committee, for example, many have second thoughts about interviewing an otherwise qualified candidate with a Korean or African-sounding name. But there is an ever-growing crop of binational, bilingual, and bicultural citizens who are sharing their foods, their music, and their worldviews publicly and proudly. Reversing previous trends, many public figures, especially entertainers from other countries and cultures, are keeping their given names, signaling that the melting pot is becoming a salad bowl, where all flavors, textures, colors, and shapes are maintained. What's in a name? A lot. Our pride, our identity, our ancestry, even our faith. I remember who and what I am and where I come from, and I am very proud of the name given to me by my parents. Nothing will make me change that reality. I am also very proud of the name given to me by God, Christian. Antonio, Tony, Juan Aja Torrens, Honorably Retired Presbyterian Church USA Minister, current moderator for the Peace USA's National Hispanic Latinx Presbyterian Caucus, an elected member of the Racial Equity Advocacy Committee, and an adjunct professor at McCormick Theological Seminary in Chicago. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Satisfy us with your love in the morning, and we will live this day in joy and praise. We lift our voices in prayer and praise, Holy God, for you have lifted us to new life in Jesus Christ, and your blessings come in generous measure. Especially we thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ for all. And the wonder and beauty of creation. The love of family and friends. Opportunities for faithful service.
particular blessings of this day. People of God, for what else do we give thanks? We focus on our names and the names of those around us. We also join in prayer for Sarah Lasharnis of the Presbyterian Mission Agency and Elizabeth Little of the Board of Pensions. God of new beginnings and second chances, we thank you for never giving up on us. We thank you for the blessing of diversity that calls us to be a truly multiracial, multicultural church. Keep our hearts and minds welcoming into our communities of faith. Amen. We hold up before you human needs, God of compassion, for you have come to us in Jesus Christ and shared our life so that we may share his resurrection. Especially we pray for the one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. Peace and justice in the world. Those in whom we see Christ's suffering. Those who offer Christ's compassion. Particular concerns of this day. People of God, for what else do we pray? We pray for Joy, a neighbor of Debbie's and a former play school teacher who is in the hospital and has been diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. We pray for Diane and David. Diane was a former office administrator here who is, they're both experiencing health issues. We pray for Barbara, a friend of the church who collapsed and went to the hospital. For Brooke, Barbara's daughter-in-law, who will be having major surgery or is recovering from major surgery. For Michael, Dennis's nephew in St. Louis, who has stage 4 prostate cancer and bone cancer. For Barbara, who continues to recover after breaking her pelvis. And the Carter family at the loss of the father. Eternal God, our beginning and our end, be our starting point and our haven, and accompany us in this day's journey. Use our hands to do your creation, and use our lives to bring others the new life you give this world in Jesus Christ, Redeemer of all. Amen. Now let us continue to pray using the words that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen. Bless the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Thank you so much for joining me today for daily prayer. Join me tomorrow for some more. Like this video, share it with someone else. Click on the subscription and the notification button, as well as going to our website, johncalvinchurch.org. Our liturgy today came from the Book of Common Worship of the Presbyterian Church USA, 2018 edition. Our readings came from the New Revised Standard Version, Daily Lectionary. And our devotion came from the Mission Yearbook of the Peace USA. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a very blessed day, and we'll see you next time. Bye.